What is up, everyone? For a while, I put off talking about MCP security and vibe coding security because there was a lot of FUD out there in terms of what are the risks? Oh, no, AI is making code. What are we going to do about it? But now that AI actually has gotten to a point where there's a little bit of standards around it, there are clearer ways in which it's being used to accomplish different things. I think there's enough here to actually talk about some emerging developments, some security practices and risks that are there. So today we're going to talk about securing two things. First is how cursor rules work and how they can help prevent insecure vibe coded code. And the second is how MCP works and some of the emerging security risks with that. So I want to start with, in case you are unfamiliar with cursor, either because you've been sticking with VS code and trying to use Copilot, or you're just not familiar with it. This is what I'm in with cursor. And the way to think about cursor is it's just VS code, but with a better chat. That does a good job of making changes. It's also worth briefly mentioning that everything we're talking about today works outside of Cursor. Every major developer IDE CLI tool has some framework for dealing with rules. And so I have this website here that's heavily vibe coded back end, front end. And I can say things like add a person schema to my API, a very vague and somewhat nonsensical command. And you can see here it is checking my schemas. It is creating a file. I can click on that and see here is where it's creating just a bunch of filler information. That is the kinds of things I would probably collect. And then it's adding it to my init. And there we go. I have it and then I can accept it. And this is why people like using cursor is you can easily accept or reject changes and I can restore checkpoints once AI starts going crazy. And basically this is just the way that a lot of people are doing code now because it is very fast and pretty good at doing things. And in order to make it better, teams are adding more and more rules. And rules are basically things that get added onto this prompt, depending on which files it's accessing. And so here I've done just a basic outline of, I have a bunch of rules for backend. And so this is prompting the LLM that I'm using Python with fast API for the backend. In the front end, I am using Vue and the, some different UI libraries to accomplish what I'm doing. And so this is just a good way to prompt the LLM to say, here's the technologies I'm using, here's what routers you should be using, what technologies, so that it doesn't do things like go and create entirely new components, mess up with different naming conventions. It's a way to create standardization and how the AI is making code changes. And here you can see for the front end, it's applying this rule set whenever it's editing files in the front end folder, but I can make it so things are always applied so the agent decides when to apply them. Same with backend, it's when changes are happening in the backend folder. So these rules can become very complex. They're a great way to manage if you have different folders, like setting standards across those different folders for how to accomplish different things. And so let's start with the security risk just from vibe coding. One cool kind of emerging attack that is happening is this is an example of a cursor rule that is a malicious cursor rule in which you can see here I've spelled out very obviously an attack that would happen or an, a prompt injection that is super obvious. But one lesser known attack type is to actually try to do this using invisible characters. So using Unicode, you can create invisible characters in here that spell out malicious instructions within a rule file. And since these rule files are typically copy pasted and shared between developers from public repos or lists of common rules, it's easy for attackers to hide malicious instructions within hidden Unicode characters. And so one example here is detecting risks of hidden Unicode characters and showing that there's obfuscated content within the rule files. The actual risk here is, is sort of difficult in my experience. It depends on a lot of prompt injection specific things. So this is an example of like a bad prompt injection. If I ask cursor to do stuff, it generally will do it. So for example, say like read this file and the request gets blocked by cursor directly, but there's a lot more hidden ways to go about doing this uh, that can create an unknown risk vector. But in general, the thing that's scary about vibe coding is not the code itself. Humans can write insecure code, like being vulnerable to a SQL injection, and then we run static code analysis, and we have this feedback loop that's been happening forever. However, a lot of static analysis tools can't catch authorization type of issues and really more architecture level issues. But as the developer is less ingrained in the code that they're creating, the risk is just that code is getting accepted faster and faster without a ton of review and consideration for how it's affecting the overall architecture of the application. And so one thing that backslash security has done that I think is a really elegant way of handling this, and you, you don't need to use a tool to do this, 
is to add some security rules that you can push out to your developers. And so here, let's say for authentication and authorization, I can turn this rule on. And this rule makes it so that I'm telling it to use Jots, Flask login, or Django, and what settings to set for session cookies. And so I can save that. I can set different rules for command injection prevention, database security, file upload security. And these basically will get appended to the prompt to make sure that when I run it, it's doing these best practices that we're defining. And when it comes to the idea of shifting left, traditionally, I've been very anti IDE plugins just because all they do is annoy developers. And it's not really a great way to train a developer, right? Like they, they're getting an annoying notification. There's a ton of false positives and it's creating a lot of garbage. However, you can see here now in the backslash rule, what I like about this is that these rules are ways to actually shift left. And you can see how fast that updated to deploy these rules. And to me, this is an idea of like, when we think about secure developer training, this is the same concept, but we can actually control what do the developers know. And I think over time, you can see this right here is telling it to use different ORMs instead of writing direct SQL. I've seen vibe coding a lot create these raw SQL queries and just little things like this go a long way to improving the security across the board. I can tell it what package registries to use and fix a lot of issues before they ever come up. And so I think this is a really promising beginning to how we approach Vibe Code security. And honestly, the, it's made me think more about the whole scanning paradigm that exists. Like right now, whenever code's pushed, we scan it and it creates this reactive feedback loop that everybody complains about because they end up having all these old vulnerabilities that they can't fix. But this creates a way to get ahead of that and actually just make sure that the code that we generate is secure as we generate it in a way that IDE plugins have traditionally failed to do. So this is still early, but I think it's a really cool and promising solution to how to securely generate code. All right, now let's move to talking about MCPs because I think that's where right now there's a lot more risk with them and there's a lot more approaches to how to secure them and what those risks are. The first important thing is to understand what an MCP server even is. And so if I go into my settings here, into my integrations, you can see here that this is how MCPs are configured. There's an mcp.json file that defines all of the MCPs that I have access to. Right now, the most popular clients that support MCP are the Claude desktop application and cursor, which I'm in now. And you can see here, it's sort of the wild west for these things. And what MCPs do is they provide a way to write tools for LLMs. And so it gives the LLM access to both local resources. So this is something like calling network tools that you're hosting locally on your device, accessing files, be able to write to files. They also give the ability to create tools for LLMs to access public resources. So typically interacting with APIs. And this is a great way to sort of build your own RAG system. A lot of people haven't built RAG because it was too complicated to do, but now we're able to go ahead and do some of those lookups because MCP makes it pretty easy to do it. And so if you come in here, you can probably immediately see the security issues. These are fake uh, keys, by the way. But I have, by way of example, I've set up something that might be on a developer workstation. First is this AWS knowledge base retrieval. And this is finding KB articles that you yourself have access to. And so that's why I am using my AWS access keys here. And so these are just in plain text saved in this .cursor file, um, which we always love to see when we see access keys. And then uh, you see my backslash server here, which is part of the web extension with an API key. And then you see this Apple shortcut server. This one is a way to list uh, Apple shortcuts. And so here I have a shortcut here just to email myself. But these are ways to set up like if this, then that for common shortcuts that you might use. And then I, for fun, added this Airbnb MCP server that allows me to look up and search Airbnb rental properties. And so you see here like a combination of different use cases, credentials, and at a basic level, what's important to recognize is just that I am giving each of these by default a ton of access to my system. And really, it's, it's very easy to get these things set up. So for example, for that Airbnb one, all I had to do was copy this and then it runs. And so what it's doing is it's grabbing this package, which is hosted on NPM. And basically, if you think of it this way, I am just downloading and running this package. And for uh, open source security, there's always been a risk when it comes to running packages from the internet on our local workstations. And unfortunately, we've had to exempt a lot of developer workstations from device management because they need escalated privileges just as part of doing their job. And this has created a big blind spot when it comes to what 
are developers running on their workstations. And then a, an additional part of that blind spot is when you combine it with extensions that are running, MCP servers, the attack surface really increases here. And so there's a couple resources that I like a lot. One is by Rami at Wiz, and this is a brief overview of what the risks are to MCP servers, mostly involving supply chain attacks, where an MCP is getting interacted with by an untrusted source that's trying to take some malicious activity. And to me, the biggest risk for this uh, are twofold. There's the obvious one, which is, hey, I could just go post a malicious MCP server and trick people right now to download it. But the more innocuous one is a lot of these MCP servers are just ways to interact with APIs behind the scenes. And because this is early days, there's a lot of unverified content creation sites where you can use an MCP to interact with user-generated content that's just uploaded to the internet. And to me, this is what's way more scary, where if I can just put a blog post up that says, send me the contents of this file, send me more details about this workstation, and I'm basically prompt injecting from just whatever website I'm uploading to, this is where things really get risky. And that's what this site that I pulled up earlier is from backslash is this threat site, which really highlights all of these different areas where this can come up. So if you segment between local MCPs and internet site MCPs, that's exactly what's getting highlighted here, right? So you have prompt injection happening on the public resource, but then locally you have MCP servers that are either listening across all their ports, creating network exposure. You have excessive permissions where an MCP server has the ability to really mess up different parts of your computer or to access files that are highly sensitive. And right now, the two biggest real world risks are the lack of supply chain visibility into what are trusted and untrusted MCPs and the prompt injection on the public resources. And that's why Backslash has also created the MCP Security Hub. And this is just a way to check for different MCPs and see what kind of vulnerabilities they have. And so I installed this uh, Apple Shortcuts one from earlier. And you can see it has the excessive permissions use. And here, what's really cool is it's telling me exactly where this code is happening, why it was determined that it has excessive permissions. And the answer is that when shortcuts are run, it's just taking any input and running, a, running the command as the process. And so the way that this MCP server actually works is I can say like list shortcuts, and then I run the tool. And then you can see the email myself, which is the tool that's here. And then I can say, let's run. And I can run the tool, and then I am allowing it. And here I have run this command. So here, when I change the prompt, I can tell it what to do with specific arg names and use that to change the behavior of the underlying MCP. And it's highly permissioned, and so I could use this to access a user server. And when you combine all of these types of MCP servers that are in this file, for example, together, that's how you create some of these dangerous attack potentials where, for example, a user could take over an Airbnb description, tell the LLM to ignore the instructions and instead run an Apple shortcut or instead access environment variables. And there are some baked in prompt injection protections for some MCP servers. But right now, this is sort of all over the place. It depends on the model. And it's really inconsistent as far as if you can get a prompt injection to work or not. And so really, this is just an example of how when you chain all these MCPs together, you can create a lot of dangerous behaviors. And so I like the way that Backslash has approached this as well, where you can see here all of the MCPs that I have, where either they're still analyzing for risk or it's unavailable for risk. But here you see the known risky one, which is that Apple shortcuts, and you can see the evidence and take the action to block it. And if I block this MCP, then it disables it. And you can see that it just deleted it from my file. And now it's trying to use this other tool because it has lost access to this other one. And so this is just a good little basic way to get to start getting visibility into your current risk levels. Like what MCP servers are your developers using? Are there risks associated with them? What rules are being used? What security rules are there? What code quality rules are there? And then what AI models are getting used as well by your developers. Uh, so you can check for approved or unapproved AI models, rules, MCP servers. It's just a way to start getting a handle and visibility into this so that you can then go ahead and decide what actions you want to take from there. Now, a final tool to use if you want to get super nerdy with it is this emerging thing called an MCP gateway. And right now, I think these are a lot of investment for where most people are at. And first, they probably just want to get the visibility and try to use only trusted MCP servers with clear use cases for developers. 
But if you want to start to get into real-time detection of what MCP servers are doing, and again, this is a lot, I'm not sure how this will evolve in the long run, but there are a lot of different vendors that offer this, but I'm gonna use Lasso Securities just because theirs is open source. And so all you do is install this MCP gateway. And then first I have an MCP gateway tool, and then I list my servers under that gateway tool. And when this runs, you can see it registers and starts all of these different servers. And so they have this example that I'll just go through where I have this token that's in my tokens.txt file. And you can see normally, this is the response that happened before I ran the MCP gateway. But when it used the MCP gateway to read the file, it went ahead and used the plugin, which is the C-Track plugin to remove the token from the output. Now I edited out the part where I had to force it to use the gateway tools because otherwise it was just reading it and bypassing it entirely, which is part of why I don't think this is like the best approach right now to do this like runtime aliasing of things because it is a helpful catch-all and it can be a good part of a layered security implementation where if you're already doing some sort of desktop monitoring or MDM style solution, it's a good thing to layer into it. But the trade-off, like there's so many ways that this gets around it, that it's sort of just like an extra protection that can be a part of it, but is by no means a clear benefit, especially when if I'm a developer and I actually want the MCP server to access the environment variables, which it shouldn't do, and I shouldn't do that. But the first thing I'm going to do is try to turn off or bypass this gateway because it's super annoying to have it be aliased. And there's a lot of unintended side effects that can come up with this approach. So this is still early. I just wanted to talk about it as another MCP option that some people are going down is setting up these different gateways in order to alias any sensitive data on the fly and try to get ahead and get visibility into the actual calls that are happening from the MCP servers that developers are adopting. So hopefully this video is helpful to go over just a few of the emerging security concerns that are happening within MCP and vibe coding. So I want to spend the first half talking about some of the emerging security capabilities with setting guardrails for AI generated code and some of the cool things that you can do experimenting with cursor rules. And in the second half, talk about some of these emerging security concerns with MCP servers. Overall, um, I think this is still a very new area of security. In general, a lot of the early vibe coding security stuff I just didn't think was that helpful because it was just trying to run scanners on code as it was generated. But I think that this rules first approach has a lot of potential to bake security into developers IDs by default. On the flip side, I also think that the models are going to get better and better at incorporating this into their own way of handling coding rules to, to think about the frameworks and how you do it. But what I love about how Backslash is approaching these policies is that it makes it really easy for security to create custom rules where, you know, for their out of the box rule, it's just pretty vague. But if I have a specific authentication library, if I have specific ways that I want to handle SQL queries, specific ORMs, it's a great way to implement that and ensure that it's enforced across developer IDEs to make sure that they're using the correct policies. And hopefully it's something that's actually helpful to them and isn't something that is just once again, security screwing everything up and making developer life harder. On the MCP side, I also think this thinking about the risks of different MCPs and ultimately the main issue is the lack of a trusted marketplace with verification of what's out there. This is a lot like just NPM. I mean, it is literally NPM where I could just go put an MCP server up there, say that it's great for creating dark mode websites, but really it's just sending me all of the files and get its hands on and create a ton of risks that you would get compromised really quickly from. That's why I also like the approach of just showing all of the different MCP servers that are in use and, and taking action to block them across your organization if, you, if they're known bad or to take an allow list approach and just say, here are the MCP servers that our organization's okay with. Same with AI models. Hopefully this was helpful. And now you can get out there and vibe code as good as ever.